Welcome to Girl in the Gov, the podcast. Where our goal is to make politics more accessible and less intimidating. The show features an interview with an expert in the political field, walking us through the many cues we have about politics, civics, government, and more. By providing civic education in the places we are. On our phones. And in the language we speak. And yes, we know, we say like a lot. It's kind of the point. Because <laughs> politics needed a rebrand. Welcome back to Girl on the Go of the podcast. I'm just kind of a little... I'm just kind of laughing because I feel like Trump really blue balled us hard because first of all, let's just give a little backstory because yesterday we obviously talked about the Trump indictment situation in our top stories. If you haven't listened yet, go listen. But when Trump went on True Social and was like, I'm getting arrested, go protest everyone. Sam texts me and and we're like, do we need to reroute all of our content and make sure we're like on top of it is World War Three, Civil War number two mm-hmm. going to go down on Tuesday? Like we might need to restructure everything. And like literally crickets, apparently crickets. like the only protesters are protesters for Trump to get arrested. <laughs> like everyone who wants him arrested is who's protesting right now. Again, who knows what can happen always just right. hoping for the Be best cautious. expecting the worst but yeah nothing has happened yet i saw punch bowl said tomorrow is the absolute earliest that an indictment could come so that's that's where we're at. we are we are right tomorrow now. being wednesday when this episode Sorry, yes. is out okay. correct yes wednesday. just for the people just for, yeah, the people. for the people what a world well what a world i i do agree it's a blue ball because in a in a very positive way thank you you know, this is the one time being, well, wait, no, that doesn't even make any sense. Hmm. I was going to say, like, this was the one time I'm excited to have been blue balled, but that was really make any sense. <laughs> like, I've blue balled a lot of people, but I have not been blue balled. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the, you know, female version of blue balled is. I'm sure there's something out there. There's but... got to be something. And now that we say this, it's going to be like up on one of our TikTok FYPs tonight. Yeah. We can like probably there's go to, like, gotta Urban be dictionary and find it, but I'm sure there's been times in both of our lives when we got female blue balled before, but um, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. like this, honestly, because especially given the way you know we really have made it our brand here, waiting for the day that Trump gets arrested, you know, and it's it's really here on our fingertips potentially. And speaking of the one thing that I did see Ooh. was a little excerpt uh, just about this potential indictment Mm, and it says trump will be fingerprinted and his mugshot will be taken though he won't have a perp walk and may not be handcuffed (laughs) samantha oh i saw your tiktok i did guys we are making merch with that when trump's mugshot comes out you can best believe there will be a full merch launch made and I hope we're the only ones who do it, but just putting that out there because, wow, that's going to be I wonder, stunning. not to phone the legal team here, I wonder about the copywriting element of it all, but if there is an issue. I feel like I've seen so many shirts with mugshots on them, and I also like, feel like mugshots are always used. It's like their own mugshot, though, usually. No, but I've seen like... Also, I don't think that even matters. It's like if you're a celebrity and you paparazzi of you, it doesn't mean you can use a picture, you know? Well, look, le- legal team will we'll look into yeah. this, but regardless, but, then we'll draw it. We'll we'll have it. Or like, Trump- seen, have you been to like bars with like all people's mugshots in them? You know, like people use mugshots all the time. But nonetheless, we're looking but into that- it because mm-hmm. that would just be gold, golden. That would be gold. And besides that, besides that I do want to, and this is in the merch category, and then I have a Trump comment as well. Okay. That of course I thought about after we popped off yesterday. Hours later, I was scratching my head. I was like, ah, that would have been smart to say. But before I say that, is the stickers of it all. Is we have really cute new smiley face podcast stickers. Mm-hmm. And just we actually just ordered some more because we ran out because everyone loves themselves a sticker, which we get. We were like, anyways, have you So, so do desire to get yourself some smiley face stickers, little smiley pack, some green, some pink, 
what you're going to do is you're going to take a screenshot of the episode that you're listening to. It can be any Girl on the Go of the Podcast episode, whether it's a favorite, you're re-listening to it, whether it's a new one, whatever. You're going to post it to your story with a link to that episode and tag us. And once we get the little notification, we'll ask for your address and we'll take it from there. But that's how you're going to get your stickers. You've been told. You've been warned. You've been ranted at. There you then, go, folks. <laughs> Trump yeah. comment? Oh, yes. Okay. So I was thinking about what they might indict him on, the specific crime itself, and how we were talking about yesterday, how, like, you know, it is kind of like a political move, despite, like, this kind of John Edwards previously falling into this category, which I totally forgot about until someone pointed out to me. But regardless of that, is this is, of all of the crimes that we can think that Trump has committed or probably has committed, this is, like, the small fish of it all, really. Mm-hmm. And then I was thinking about, like, the classic mafia dude, or dudes, mafia dudes, and how they usually don't get caught or arrested or taken away based on the murders they've committed, the hits they've taken taken yeah. out on people, like throwing people to the fishy snot. Mm-hmm. They get caught on taxes. They get yeah. caught on little minuscule, like, fuck-ups mm-hmm. that get them behind bars and that actually usually bring it down. It's either that or if the whole kit and caboodle comes crashing down and it's a huge sting. But, like, a lot of those dudes fit into that category. And I say dudes because, let's be real, it's mostly dudes. The house audacity here. No, it's so true. Like, they... It's usually because, like, they have these big teams around them, which is something we kind of touched on yesterday in Top Stories of, like, it's hard to kind of place blame when there's a whole team of people who are technically making these decisions together. And it's like, are you coming after each individual who made that decision within the team? Are you going after the face of the team? And so I think that's why also Trump has basically gotten away with so much. Yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting parallel for sure. But again, we will just see what happens, I guess. This was... I guess this it has the blue blown ball up. of the century. The blue ball of the century it didn't blow up the way that we fully expected, at least yet. Again, we could be. Mm. Mm. Speaking of like the blue balls of it all, mm. if anyone's listening on release day, like Wednesday, the 22nd of this episode, we are doing a dating event, a dating organization. <laughs> I was literally going to say organizing. the same exact thing. <laughs> You're listening same on page. Wednesday, like morning. Noon. Mm-hmm. Sometime before, what time is it at? I think 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Eastern. So 3 p.m. Pacific time for all y'all who don't like to do math like us. Yeah, we are organizing on a dating app for the Wisconsin Supreme Court race with Next Gen America. And I'm so fucking excited. <laughs> Me too. It's going to be so much fun. I can't wait to meet everyone and also just be organizing this way. It's so fun. And honestly, I feel like this is us on dating apps by accident anyways. Like genuinely the amount of people that the conversations turn political just because of like what our jobs are. And like like even on mine, I have like a picture of like the podcast and then it's like, oh, it's your podcast about? Oh, political podcast. And then there you go. And it becomes like accidental, but Mm -hmm. this is purposeful. I am so curious, so curious what Madison, Wisconsin dudes are like. Is that where you're going to put your location? Well, it's between there and Milwaukee. And I just, I don't know, Madison, like, you know, when you like say things in a certain order, I say Madison and Milwaukee. And so that's just how that happened. I went alphabetical. I guess I should go to Madison given my name, but- Um no, I'm just so excited. I said this on our Instagram little story, but we had Christy Johnson on who's actually coming on back on the pod soon. Yep. We had her on our very, very first episode. She's the national press secretary at Next Gen, And we had her on right before the 2020 election. And she actually kind of coined this idea of organizing on dating apps at Next Gen, And she brought it up in that episode over two years ago. And we were like, what? That's the most genius thing we've ever heard. Oh, and God. Next Gen has fully taken it on since. And it's been super successful for them to really just reach young people through dating apps and get them registered to vote, get them a voting plan. And again, it just couldn't be more genius. And I'm so excited to participate and just honestly see what it's like, see how people respond. I'm just, I'm so excited. So 
if you are listening to this before that time, go to the link in our episode description to sign up and join us. We will be like the special guests, but we will also be participating and we want mm-hmm. you guys there too. So definitely join. And I said this in our to our Gov Clubbers too. Even if you're not single, hop on in. Maybe even bring your significant other with you. It could be a fun way to spice things up. <laughs> Stop it. But you're just doing it to save democracy. So join. It'll be a good excuse too to just like hop on a dating app to try it Wait. if you've never been on one. If <laughs> you've been in a relationship, just just fun, fun times. I can you imagine though, like just to play Debbie Downer negative Nancy for a second. Can you imagine that's like the next new like cheating excuse? I was only on the app like for democracy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. like obviously I'm sure with like so many so many humans yes but like hmm, yeah I'm excited too to ask tomorrow like if anyone's found love yeah <laughs> and if like there's organizers yeah, in Wisconsin who are actually like on the dating apps and it's a good vetting system to be like hey like time. are you registered to vote do you know that there's this election and then I can get that po- political conversation out of the way and maybe this guy or girl or whoever is like yeah I'm really excited about it. I'm ready to go vote. And you're like, oh my God, I'm in love. <laughs> and maybe you meet up. Maybe you go on a first date. Like, that's cool. What if, um, what if like, have... we find the loves of our lives in Madison, Wisconsin <laughs> on a dating app? The problem is, Madison Blue, that would be incredibly on brand for us. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it really would. Unfortunately. It's not that. Make a move. Yeah, like no offense to Wisconsin. Love you guys. I hate the cold as it is. And you guys really go hard in the cold. Mm-hmm. Like next level. Next level like, cold. Yeah. Once they vote and cast their ballot in this important race, then I would be like, honey, I need you to move. Move out here to California. You'll mm-hmm. have fun. You'll warm up. Because here's and- the thing. is you like a burly mountain man vibe, oh, and love. I feel like that could be so wisconsin also i'm excited to see what what type of dudes are out there for sure for wisconsin, vibes, which is like yeah. my my type hockey guys are really hot mm-hmm. usually pretty slimy though that's the problem slimy like, like shady? slimy so shady and usually like really <laughs> crass behind the scenes like the worst of the locker room talkers in my experience they are definitely but- like have vulgar humor but i feel like i haven't seen like them be like too off. shady yeah But they're like vulgar humor, which like I kind of find funny sometimes, but that's fair. Nonetheless, join us. Join us in Wisconsin. Go. Maybe you'll find love. But what you will do is you will make an impact on a very, very, very important Supreme Court race in Wisconsin that could have huge implications on democracy, reproductive rights and more. So go participate. What a fun way to get your feet wet organizing, too, if you haven't before. So Sign on up. There you go. There you go. Shall we introduce our amazing guest for today? We shall. We shall. All right. Well, today we are actually going to a different state. We're going to Texas. Grab your cowboy boots and let's roll to Texas. Yeehaw. Wow. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Going to Texas. I basically should never be the face of a tourism campaign because clearly, like, this is what you get from me. It's just yeehaws and cowboy boots. But I do own a lot of cowboy boots, so. Just Have saying. you ever been to Texas? No. I had a feeling you had that. I can't even picture you there. I would probably not last today. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Texas. Okay. We are talking Texas legislature. So it's idiosyncrasies, how it works, some of its weird rules, getting the basics. So this is going to be one of those episodes that if you're ever curious about the basics of Texas politics or you don't really understand like how something's operating, you're going to want to go back to it. So this is definitely a download. This is definitely a save. It's definitely a share with any of your friends in Texas and also all of your friends that are interested in Texas politics. And to that point, if you were sort of sitting there after 2022 and being like, wait, so Beto didn't win again? Like we've got Abbott, Lord Farquaad is still here, still in business and really confused about it. We talk about that in this episode as well. So there's a lot to kind of obviously enjoy this time around, but it's definitely one to also save for later, revisit. Anyways, we had our friend Udrak Nakanga come on. She actually ran for the Texas House previously, and she now works in Texas politics really right up in it as a policy associate. So we're going to just really cover a lot of territory. Without further ado, 
here's Udawak. All right. We are excited to get into it, to have you on the show. This is also, I feel like, just the best combination of all worlds, the content creators of the political space, <laughs> the young people of the political space coming together. We were following you on TikTok for I don't even know how long and before mm-hmm. we reached out. We're like, we need to chat with this girl. She is on fire mm-hmm. and killing it. And we want to talk about all of your work, including your work at the FIA Center. So mm-hmm. you wouldn't mind starting off with like chatting about what you do now and also how that connects to your content creation in the political world first and foremost thank y'all for even having me i love girl and gov like thank Mm -hmm. you for like all the work y'all do and creating like a safe space for like people like me to come on your platform and just like speak that's beautiful to me but hey everyone my name's udo aknakanga i am a policy associate at the afia center a political content creator and a new profound author i just (gasps) released my first ebook one of many don't worry one of many (laughs) how I utilize a useless degree in 2022. So that's always good. But Mm -hmm. currently I do work as a policy associate at the AFIA Center. We're based in Dallas, Texas. We are the first and only current Black-led reproductive justice org in North Texas. Essentially what we do there is we focus on transforming the lives and health and overall well-being of Black women and girls. We do that by providing like refuge, education, resources, and so forth. Um, But yeah, that's pretty much what I'm doing now. I I work on the policy end, so I represent them when it comes to the relationship with public seat holders and making sure that proper language and legislation is being crafted that specifically benefits the people we serve. That's amazing. Love all of that. And can you kind of give us a little bit of a snapshot of like what a policy associate does like how that role even functions at an org like yours and you know do you collaborate with representatives like can you kind of paint that picture Mm -hmm. for everyone of what that role typically looks like yeah so essentially what i do is provide like the strategic support at the city state and federal level so i'm creating policy materials that includes like that include research fact sheet fact sheets drafting like necessary like action alerts and so forth and i'm doing that on behalf of the center so we're Essentially, what I am is the um, middleman between the AFIA Center and public seat holders as far as like public policy. So I meet with representatives specifically right now since we're in some legislative session. I'm focusing on like state representatives trying to push and navigate bills that specifically like help black and black women in black women, the people that we serve, essentially. So that's pretty much what I do or what I'm doing right now. I work with partnerships with varied and diverse constituents and so forth. So, yeah, it's really, really fun. It's a lot, but it's really worth it because it's Mm -hmm. very fulfilling, I would say. Wait, okay. Question with that, too. Like, what's, like, the best part? What's the worst part? Like, if there's on the scale. (laughs) So the best part is, like, working with the AFIA Center is not having to explain my Blackness, so to say. So we are Black-led. Our employees are Black. So it's, like... A lot of times me, like being young and being in the workforce previously, like the small things that people don't really realize that Black women have to go through, like, oh, am I going to wear my hair natural today? Am I going to be asked about like, is my hair, why my hair, why is my hair always changing? Or do I have to speak a certain way? Do I have to present myself a certain way to be taken seriously? Just being able to be in a safe space and be completely me without being judged is like very comfortable it's so comforting and it's like very fulfilling to me so like that's hands down the best part the worst part for me would be and it's something that I'm learning is not internalizing other people's problems so Mm -hmm. with the work you do and being that representation the work is personal it's kind of hard to like differentiate the work from personal life because it's Mm -hmm. not like it's not like because I used to work at McDonald's when I was 16 it's not like oh I'm at work and then I'm a dip and like leave like the work right. that you actually do. It follows like you. First. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think that's like probably the worst part, but I am learning to navigate through that though. But yeah. yeah. And I'm sure it's hard with everything going on in Texas specifically around, you know, reproductive access and, you know, experiencing that and working towards it. Like mm-hmm. I think 
in politics in general, there's a lot of things that can really, you can feel sort of helpless around, but hopefully, you know, the work that you guys do is so amazing that hopefully knowing that you are chipping away at it and helping out is, is so fulfilling, I'm sure. Well, you, we want to talk about this political content creator side too, and like how that journey started for you. Can you kind of give us the, the backstory there of how this all kicked off? Yeah. So I feel like it started by accident, not gonna lie. So at first, when I started using TikTok, I was in, it was in the middle of my campaign. So it wasn't like I was trying to be a political content creator. It was just more so trying to utilize social media to its max capacity to reach more people. So after the race, I was like, I was still in love with TikTok. So I was like, okay, let me just start breaking down bills. It started with just breaking down the, um, GLP 44 page report because a lot of this language like everyday people they don't want to read through that I'm not gonna lie like who yeah. wants to read through stuff like that I don't even want to do that <laughs> <laughs> well also okay I always complain about this but the way that they're formatted makes it so impossible that even if it could be like the most basic sentence on that page it's like up down side squished exactly. together and you're like I can't read this Exactly. They, I, I'm almost I'm con- like I'm convinced they do it on purpose like to like they don't want people to understand because oh, they really could have just I, I would read like a whole page like an whether it's an op-ed or a draft or a press conference release or whatever I'm like you really could have simplified this like you're using big words to sound smart or what yeah but <laughs> but that's pretty much like where it started like I just started breaking down bills and then after that I just started being more consistent I thank God for just the platform that I have now obviously I'm not like one of the mega bigger like content creators but just the impact that I have I do have mm-hmm. just with the followers that I do have now but yeah it kind of just came naturally just utilizing my platform to any degree for any for just utilizing that platform for better essentially is what and yeah well I think that's like the perfect segue into talking about Gen Z in general and how social media has become such a great organizing tool yes. which is interestingly now under a threat with all of these laws trying to ban TikTok. I'm like, hmm, mm-hmm. so sus. I wonder, like, <laughs> why that is. And on college yeah. campuses, because it's, sta- you know, like, all of that stuff. I'm like, how interesting. Mm-hmm. But regardless, I'm curious to hear about, like, your experience on social media, activating with Gen Zs, and, you know, like, what you think the social media times Gen Z potential is. You know, what mm-hmm. does what does that feel like to you? Where do you see it all going? I think it, I think people underestimate the power of social media. Like Mm -hmm. the social media can really take you from, can really flip your life in 24 hours. That's how powerful it is. I think with Gen Z and kind of growing up in the whole social media plague, younger millennials, older Gen Z, I would say, like, I think we've navigated the process of utilizing it to our benefit, whether it's for good, whether it's for bad, but just we're, we're, just understanding the strategic, um, the strategy behind social media and just using that, whether it's to grow personal businesses, growing our brand, getting the word out or so forth. It's just, it's a very, very powerful tool. Even my coworkers, I joke around with them a lot because a lot of them are older. I think I'm the only Gen Z in out of my organization, but oh my I joke around them. <laughs> yeah, I joke around with them all the time. Like, y'all gotta get on TikTok. Like I tell them, yeah. I've been telling them for a year now, but they're they're learning. It takes I I, I try to meet them where they're at where they're at. But yeah. Wait, what year were you born? 98. 98. Okay. 96. Oh, Sam, good. you're 90. I'm 93. That's like my sister. Yeah. I think 96 is like sister. right in it's the what is it called? Zen Zennial. Zennial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's in our so, pitch deck. Honestly, we are, work. this <laughs> Zoom right now is three generations, t- kind of. <laughs> no, for real. <laughs> so we love to see that. Guys, so um, I like, honestly, not to make this about me, but to make this about me, I do not know, like, at this point, what generation I'm in. Because I feel like it's, like, millennial is, like, too old. Like, I don't relate to, like, millennial content. Millennial. But millennials and then, not you know, old, though. It's not. not old. But just, like, sometimes some of the content, I'm it's like, such well, a big, I'm not. Yeah, it's, it's a such huge... a big okay. group. I also, yeah. I don't know. I wonder what the cutoff is going to be for Gen Z. Is that already I think. I think with, like, the generations, it's, like, two halves. Because, like, with millennials, you have, like, mm-hmm. the older millennials who are yeah. 
so different older than the young. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the same thing with Gen Z. It's like you have the older Gen Zs and then you have the mm-hmm. younger Gen Zs that you just raising eyebrows at. Like, what are y'all doing? Like, it's it's yeah. always been that vibe. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny to break it all down, but it's so true just back to even, you know, the power of social media and the power of this generation, both millennials and Gen Z, honestly, and how kind of the era of social media, especially looking at political action and civic action and how I think social media has been such a help to getting young people engaged. And, you know, we are always talking about that. And I think, you know, there's obviously all the downfalls of what social media can bring, but I think it's brought so much positivity just on the like political side of things and mobilizing Mm -hmm. people. And it's been a really incredible tool for that. But I think still like it's still so underestimated, especially in the political space. And we're just, you know, hopefully people will catch on to using this as such a powerful tool. But moving on to kind of Texas politics as well. Um, You you like feature Texas politics on your social media mostly, right? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, do you mostly break down policies? Like, what else do you kind of do in this crazy Texas political world? And how do you bring that to your social media content? So with, when it comes to Texas politics and social media, I'm, I've gotten backlash for it too, but <laughs> I'm at the point where like I try to just give people the information without highlighting the party, so mm. to say. So I'm trying to like shift the the narrative and the conversation when it comes to that on my social media. I like when it comes to like just navigating Texas politics on social media, it's it's good and it's bad because it's like it's so much at once like you want to make sure you're hitting all the spots you want to make sure people get the right information you want to make sure that you're not what's the word like your mental health isn't at risk either because totally Texas politics is people take that personally as well but but that's pretty much like how I kind of like navigate it when it comes to politics I'm really at the point like I said before where it's just like policy rather than party even though you'll see me call out a lot of like Republicans a lot but it's because they're easy targets at this point in Texas it's like (laughs) they're asking for themselves they literally do it to themselves it's wild yeah I agree Well, also within that experience, you did run for office for the House Mm -hmm. of Representatives in Texas. Before we get into some of the the nitty gritty of like what it looks like in the Texas state legislature, we want to talk about that experience and what you learned along the way. And I'm curious to know like what that experience was like for you and what some of the big takeaways for, you know, running as a Gen Z, like what was that like? For sure. I say it to the, I will say to the day I die, I do not regret it one bit, but I'm also going to be honest and transparent about my experience. I, after running, I can see why Gen Z's do not want to run. It is not peaches and cream. It is not easy. It is very exclusive as far as requirements of running. Um, The people aren't the nicest, obviously. That's no shade. It's just generally speaking. But yeah, it's I can see why Gen Z's would not want to run. I would 100% say that if you are not solid in who you are, your morals and your principles, it will be easy for you to be like run off track. For me personally, I stand on my principles. I stand on my morals. I let that be my driving factor. I'm very strong in my faith, strict in my faith. So that has always been my driving factor, even throughout the campaign. I'm not very, I'm not the type of person to prioritize position and power before my principles. So it was a big learning experience, especially being 22 at the time and making the ballot. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, thank you. It's it sounds crazy out loud, but I don't regret it. I actually would want to I really hope that me running other people who looked at my race finds that that spark in them to run. I want Gen Z's not only to be engaged, but I want them to be in positions of power to kind of change what we're used to, like the normalizing of struggle that we were brought up in the whole concept of that's just the way things are. I really want that narrative to change and it can only change when we're in those positions to change it instead of just going with the flow of things. But yeah. I, I I loved it, <laughs> but yeah, it good. Been- I mean, you should be so proud. I think that's so amazing. And 
I, I mean, I'm curious too what your thoughts are as far as just kind of some of the barriers that you faced and some of the things you think need to change in order for more young people to make that jump like you did. I know you said mm-hmm. like it's not easy for a Gen Z to run at this moment. Like, what do you mm-hmm. think it's going to take to hopefully make that easier for people? So I feel like just running for public office in general, it restricts certain demographics and groups out of the conversation. Number one, just money itself. Like people don't, not everybody just comes from like money, like money doesn't grow on trees. So it's like fundraising is the key point to run your campaign. Not only that, but a lot of the resources as far as like something as simple as being able to file the TEC filing, you have to learn stuff like that if you don't have the money to pay people to do it for you. So that's another barrier as well. I would also say just when you're running a campaign, the navigations of it, you have to be able to learn how to use van for example you have to learn how to like run your campaign if you don't have money to pay someone to run it for you so it's just Mm -hmm. it's just it's sad but it's like that's the reality that we're living in it just keeps certain people out of the conversation from running and I can like I said before I can see why a lot of people are oh no I'm not gonna run for office it's too much it's too much it is a lot but I personally feel like it's 100% worth it because yeah. a win, a win looks in, a win looks like different things. A lot of people think a win is getting the position. Sometimes it's the impact. Sometimes it's just meeting different people. Sometimes it's like crafting your personal characteristics as far as becoming a better speaker and so forth. So a win looks at win looks like different things in that. Yeah, totally. And we always talk about that too. Like even just politics is such a long game, and you know you have to know that you know losses are inevitable, and like, but that a lot of positive things can come from losses and like it still pushes the needle forward and like at the end of the day like that's all that matters so for sure yeah which is like ironic because i literally just got a fundraising text from adam frisch trying to campaign against long boat Lauren Bobart again. Mm -hmm. And it's just, that's a good example of like, he didn't win. And Mm -hmm. now he's trying again, because now people believe that there's momentum and there's Mm -hmm. something that can be done and there's like belief in it. So I I do think it's a win is a win. Mm -hmm. As the TikTokers say. A win is a win. A win is a win. There it is. It is. Well, I think we should get into our, I have a stupid question, but segment, because we have a lot of them. (laughs) <laughs> I'd say I'm sorry, but like we're just not because we got questions and we need answers. It's all of that. Starting with how many representatives are in the Texas House? So in the Texas House, it's composed of 150 members. So right now, I think it's 86 Republicans and 64 Democrats. I think so Republicans have the majority, but each elected for each for every two year term. So mm-hmm. okay, and Loki, how- that's more Democrats than I expected. Just saying. Side note. Oh, 64? <laughs> yeah. I thought it was going to be like four. <laughs> <laughs> I actually need to fact check that number because last time I, I maybe I'm going best off last session, but I could have sworn this session is like 86, 64 of them. But mm, yeah. Yeah. Got it. How often does the legislature meet in Texas? So legislative meet, they like meet every other year. So it's going to be odd year. So this year they're in session. So next year they'll be off and then so every other one. That is mm-hmm. so wild to me. So I know wild. they're not the only state that has it that way, but it's just like crazy that these people it's could be like, like oh, I'm just going to take, yeah, I'm just going to take a break for a year. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's fine. But I know that there are special sessions that can be called. Yeah. What's the story with those? How did they get called? Who's in charge of that? So special sessions are kind of like, it's very complex. So the governor alone can only call the special sessions. So essentially, no matter like the level difficulty of the issue, a special session, they can only meet at most 30 days. So I do know, I'm trying to think back because I know Greg Abbott, Get Greg Abbott, Governor Greg Abbott, he specifically specifically called three special sessions within the last session. So I know the first one was like 30 days. The second one was like 27 and then another 30. And then within the first one, there was like 11 different topics. And the second one, there was like 18 different topics. And the third one, there was like yeah. 10 different topics. So like special sessions, it's very complex, but they are only called with um, by the governor. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's also crazy. I mean, even back to just the, 
you know, off years and everything, like, especially with how much it takes to campaign and, you know, all the effort it takes to then only, you know, be able to really legislate like half the time that most people do in the year. I think that's kind of crazy. Is that how it is with, in y'all, like, cause y'all are in New York, right? Yeah. And I'm in California and yeah, they're like basically like Congress, you know, they go full time. It's more like, yeah, like the New York, like the sessions in the spring, then like you're, you know, back in your district in the fall. Mm-hmm. But but you're still like, that's your job. Like, you're. Yeah. 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 It's like and it's also but look, it's like also paid as a full time job. You know, yeah. like yeah. that's the salaries have been, you know, obviously there's so many arguments. as Is this enough? Is this not enough? Whatever. But they are compensated with the idea that it is the full time job. And that yeah. makes a huge difference. And I know Vermont right now is trying to change that where it's I don't remember what the pay is, but it's something like egregiously low that makes it impossible for people to you know live on so you have to have other jobs and then you have the conflict of interest scenario and it's just it Mm. snowballs so it's interesting to sort of see and i personally didn't really know growing up that like that was that was a thing i just assumed everyone hopped on over to the capital and like went to Mm. you know work every single day nine to five and i was very wrong so yeah yeah that goes back to what we spoke about previously about how it marginalizes certain people out like gen yeah. z's for example because i know with our texas legislators they make about like seven thousand two hundred a year so it's like yeah yeah and that's again that's so crazy too just going back to like the campaigns if you're really running a campaign and trying to win like it's that's a full-time job and then what you exactly. just like do all of that work to then you know go to this kind of more it just kind of, it, I don't know, that part is really interesting to me, just knowing how, like, hard the campaigning process is to then, mm-hmm. you know, then make that amount of money and only work some of the year, especially yeah. if you're looking to make impact. It seems like that just be be rough. Agree. Yeah. Anyways, next question. <laughs> I have a few questions. I mean, that was our one of our tangents. Um, no, you're good. We love it. What is the lieutenant's, lieutenant governor's role? in the texas state legislature because that's different per state as well yeah so pretty much with the lieutenant governor is kind of like the vice president to the president they're just there for aesthetics i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> totally kidding but oh, no they, man, I'm good. but no they they're they are supposed to act as governor if the governor were to be like deceased or if they temporarily temporarily are absent from office but also like within texas like the lieutenant governor they generally succeed as what's that word they pretty much like establish like all the like special and like standing committees so like they'll appoint like chairpersons and members and like they assign like the state legislation to like the committee of their choice and so forth so like they do work as well i think lieutenant in my opinion, I feel like the lieutenant governor is actually more powerful than the governor in Texas. Mm, wild. That is yeah. actually, okay, I feel like that's one of those things where it's like people definitely don't realize that. Yeah. Those quiet ones. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The sneaky ones. The sneaky mm-hmm. ones. 100%. Oh, lieutenant governors. Interesting, interesting. Well, in terms of the work that happens, i.e. the bills, can you run us through how a bill makes it through or doesn't make it through in the texas state legislature like what's the process for a bill so the bill itself is the it's pretty much the most common type of like the legislative document so it's like the only means like it's the only way for something to be law for a law to be enacted amended or repealed so with the bill it's first introduced by a legislative um the public seat holder that we elect So they're divided like in chambers, chambers. So like for that bill to be considered, they have to pass like the chamber first and then it goes to like the next process. So like the steps in like the bill's progress are basically like the same in like each chamber. So like there's many opportunities for them to like amend the bill or defeat the bill in the chamber. And then when passed, it goes to like the next process and like kind of continues. And yeah, then it hits the Senate. And like when the Senate passes it, then goes from there (laughs) yeah it's schoolhouse rock just (laughs) coming back for us no yeah it's always it's such a like interesting 
but kind of boring process, but always important to highlight for sure. And kind of like moving into that as well. You talked a little bit about the makeup of the current state legislature as Mm -hmm. far as, you know, the breakup of power there. But rumor has it that Democrats can also be committee chairs. Is that Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, whereas in Congress, like the party in power gets to be committee chairs, right? So how, why, what's the story there of in Texas, you know, Democrats being able to be those committee chairs and have that power? So with the whole committee chair thing, there was actually like, I don't know who started it, but it was like a small group of Republicans like that were trying to push no Democratic committee chairs, which it hasn't really happened prior. So I don't know if they were just trying to get a reaction. But for, mm-hmm. yeah, it was like pretty much like a small but but vocal minority of House Republicans just calling to end for the chamber's like long time tradition of having committee chairs from both parties. Speaker of the House, Dade Fallon. I don't I don't even know if I say his name right, but I always say Fallon, Fallon, whatever. They prevented the matter from even getting to vote on the floor. So it did they did pass like a housekeeping resolution to where they you can't because you essentially can't do that. You can't just say I don't want no Democratic committee chairs. But that was kind of just like a flop. I don't know why they even entertained the idea of no Democratic committee chairs. It's just never happened historically. Yeah, well, I think also, too, like that behavior is one that's interesting and that people, especially outside of Texas, see just so much political news coming out of the state, especially the last five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's constant. Like, granted, it's also, you know, we've got Lord Farquaad, which is what we call Greg Abbott. So, you know, (laughs) take that with, you know, a grain of salt. But regardless, we're just constantly sort of seeing bad bills from our point of view, but also wacky behavior from elected. And I'm curious, like, from your point of view, like why we're seeing that, because it seems like even if even issues aside, like mm-hmm. you're maybe you're typically a Republican, but you're like, hmm, it's weird. This power grid totally failed. And then they messed up this. And I did get, I don't, you know, fill in the blank of whatever issue they literally just couldn't even execute on from like a, an admin perspective. Mm-hmm. It's weird and all and the corruption stuff or whatever. You're like, but why do these people keep voting for them like again i like i'm not necessarily advocating for them vote for a different republican but it's like they're not even voting for different republicans they're voting for exactly. literally the same people exactly and expecting a different result exactly that, yeah no you're 100 percent right that goes down to like this state like on both ends like this concept of wanting different results with the same approaches it makes no sense whatsoever right now in texas politics we just see the same people getting elected mainly because of name recognition a lot of people who vote they just vote comfortably they would rather just have the same person in rather than trying something new um but i would say like even a key thing that we see with like the gop texas gop is the concept of baiting something that they do that i talk about a lot they bait and democrats are always biting so they'll pit like the most crazy thing out there like oh we don't want a b and c but then we continue as democrats to entertain them like it that's what makes it like a topic of conversation because we're entertaining it and they know what they're doing like the republicans in texas they are a lot of things but one thing they are not is dumb they are very smart very strategic and they know what they're doing that's why they tend to get what they want but it's just it's a lot like it's a cycle at this point i'm that's curious, really but... interesting yeah, yeah well, i was, I was curious say... like an example of that you the said an example for example, like what we spoke about earlier, the whole I don't want no Democratic committee chairs that they said. I was like, how? Like, that wasn't I feel like they just use stuff like that as forms of distraction for another thing. The what was it that they said that this legislative session they weren't. So for this legislative session, specifically in Texas, they said they're not prioritizing bodily autonomy bills, even though with everything that happened, SBA overturning Roe v. Wade and everything like that, they're just not going to prioritize that because essentially they're losing. They don't want to lose seats locally because a lot of women, even on Republicans, they want the right to bodily autonomy. So they're just saying, OK, we're going to stop like talking about it. We're going to stop doing this. And that they took in that pass- passenger seat role when it comes to that conversation, because they know that's the smartest thing or strategic thing to do, especially in the midst of everybody still heated about that. But yeah. Interesting. Do you think it'll come back then like the next roundabout, like the next session? Like it's almost like they're smart enough to be like, let's just wait for the 
the dust to settle? Like, is that their strategy? I think yes and no, because I think it may come back, but also I think they would prioritize it with like, I don't know how to explain it. Like they won't publicly prioritize it as far as publicly speak about it, but they're going to make sure it gets done behind closed doors. That way, like it's a form of distraction, like with the critical race theory stuff, they stopped talking about that, but they're still that that doesn't mean they stopped working behind it, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that makes that makes a ton of sense. And I think, yeah, I think a lot of those heinous bills, not only in Texas, but in states, you know, red states across the country, you know, they, I think especially in 2022 with the, the election results, like I think they noticed that, OK, maybe this isn't working mm-hmm. and it's only mobilizing people against us. So mm-hmm. it's interesting to hear that you think, you know, they're now still working on that behind the scenes, but they're not going to be as blatant about blatant about the I guess just bigotry up front yeah. potentially. So that's interesting and very dangerous and definitely something to highlight and pay attention to. But I am curious too, just about your thoughts about Texas and where you see it moving forward. I was very hopeful that Texas was gonna, you know, potentially go a different way last year. It sure didn't. <laughs> but I'm it's I'm care I'm like I was so confused though because there wasn't even like any shot but it like seemed like leading up to it there was a lot of amazing momentum in texas and so i'm curious Mm. like what your thoughts are about that and what you kind of see for the future of texas and kind of what needs to be done from turnout to i know gerrymandering is a huge issue for texas to really kind of become what it is which it really should be a blue state just given you know the growing population and the diversity you know i'm i'm just curious your thoughts of what you see for the future there For sure. That's a beautiful question. So a lot of people outside of Texas, they think we're redder than what we are. I'm going to be honest with numbers. We are a blue state. It's just the matter of resources, getting people out to the ballots. Essentially, I'm going to be real. We're missing the outside support here in Texas as well. I do believe, like I said before, people think we are redder than what we really are. We're missing a lot of funding in a lot of the most rural areas. I know with even with the last our midterm elections with the governor race and whatnot, a lot of outside public support was not given to Beto O'Rourke, just being completely honest. And a lot of division within the Democratic Party was not given proper support to not only him, but down ballots as well. I think a lot of times people rely on the top name on the ballot to help the down ballots. And that's not how it should be like whatsoever. One thing about the Republicans is that they invest in these rural small areas and those rural areas add up. If we want to turn Texas blue, we cannot rely on Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio and part of El Paso to turn it blue. We need to invest in these rural areas. When we look at congressional districts, for example, congressional district one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, (laughs) ten. 11, 12, like it's so forth. Like they are all like red in the rural areas because Republicans are investing in them. And a lot of these races are like at the 66%, 33%, like it's like farther out races. And it's like, if we want to get them closer, we need to invest in them. For example, prime example, when we look at district 15 in particular, that was flipped. It flipped back to red because it's like, where where are the people at so it's just like we just have to be willing to just invest right. in these rural areas and stop relying on name at the top of the ballot to do the work for everybody under yeah, yeah i think that, that outside influence part two is so huge and something we saw in 2022 like with north carolina and cherry beasley like i think there was just such a lack of investment because north carolina probably similar to texas you were like and it's not it's not worth worth it investment mm-hmm. it's like not strategic to go there you know it's probably red but i think you're right like it's it, it just if there is the investment there it can definitely shift because like the numbers are there yeah and i remember i can't i remember partially i don't remember what project we were working on but i was going through the different texas you know group the democratic groups per county and it was so interesting to see how many counties just had absolutely no democratic infrastructure whatsoever. Mm. And I was like, well, this is challenging. Yeah. Like, exactly. How is anything supposed to get off the ground here if there's literally not even an organization here with any infrastructure? And I'm curious from your perspective as someone that's also run for office, what infrastructure have you found to be the most helpful and that you think is like 
the necessary tools, especially in like a rural area to be like, we need these things here to be able to build, build some power. I think a key thing is that door knocking. Like it, it yeah. as tiring as it can be when you have that face-to-face interaction and you touch these people two, three, four times, they are going to remember. Cause it's one thing to send somebody a mail, but when you have that face-to-face interaction, that is where the impact is. I'm going to use Beto O'Rourke for another example. Cause with his senatorial race, when he ran for Senate, he came one of the closest races because he touched every county in the state of Texas. So it was that face-to-face interaction that nobody else has done. So when we say invest in these rural areas, we're investing in the canvassers, we're investing in touches, we're investing in conversation, we're investing in even having and hosting events within these rural areas to bring people out. That's what's needed. And that's what the Republicans are doing, but that's what we're lacking within the Democrat Texas Democrats. Yeah, totally. Do you think, well, actually, let me walk this back. Do you think there are any up and coming people that you're like, this person needs to run or this person everyone needs to keep their eye on in the Democratic like wing of Texas? Hmm. It depends what position. I'm gonna I'm not okay. gonna lie. That's fair. Because yeah, because I feel like there's some good people that I know that will make really good when it comes to like local elections. Something that people underestimate is local elections. When it comes to like the bigger pieces like senators, because I know Ted Cruz's time is ticking. Uh, his election what a shame. Is coming, <laughs> he's coming up too. So I would like to, I would honestly like to see, well, he wouldn't even work because he just won a congressional seat. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it just depends on the seat, really. Yeah. And I think there are, you know, time will tell, too, as we move through this year and yeah. move closer towards 2024. But yeah, it's going to be interesting for sure. <laughs> Is there anything that you can leave us with with just as far as like people can get involved in Texas any suggestions you think youth vote wise whatever it is like something that you really want to push across I think a key thing when it comes to getting involved is tapping into like the community organizations because community organizations they are like the voice of the actual community. We are the ones who are, again, meeting with these public seat holders, ensuring that they're doing their duties for the community. People tend to forget that these public seat holders are public servants. So you pay them to serve you. So Mm -hmm. just tapping into community organizations is like a key, key thing to not only get involved, but to stay involved and to just stay up to date with what's going on. Totally. Well, One more rack question is, how do you go about finding what organizations are in your neighborhood? Say you move to a new city, a new town, new county. What's like your number one trick for finding out what organizations are up and running in, you know, someone's neck of the woods? I would say two things. I would say research is good as far as like just Googling, seeing what's around social media, seeing what's like close to you, near to you, what's popping around you to see what best fits you. And also just getting in touch with your local county party, I would say, Mm -hmm. just ensuring like asking them like, hey, what are some organizations that focus on voter engagement, civic engagement, social justice and so forth? I think that's a, a good way to tap in and find out. 100%. Love it. Well, where can people find you and follow along with all the amazing work that you do? Y'all can find me on Uduak for Texas, U-D-U-A-K-F-O-R-T-X on all social media platforms. Amazing. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has Mm -hmm. been a pleasure. And I cannot tell you the excitement that we got when we were telling our Gov Clubbers that we were going to do a Texas episode and an episode with you. So thank you so much. You're going to make a lot of people's um podcast listening beyond and so excited so thank you (laughs) thank you so much thank you for even having me i really really appreciate it of course